Okay, so we've got nearly 30 people in the room so far. We've got lots more bookings than that, but it usually starts to spike a bit uh, in the first couple of minutes after the uh, the official start time. But Neil, um, please feel free to uh, kick us off whenever you're ready. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, hello, everybody, and good afternoon. My name is Neil Redfern. I'm the Executive Director of the Council for British Archaeology, and I'm delighted to be chairing today's session looking at archaeology and planning, illustrating how and why the system works. So first of all, just to let you know that we are recording this session, um, so uh, you'll be able to um, play it back and, and access it um, afterwards or highlight it to anyone else you want to, but just so you know, um, it, is, it is being recorded. Um, this session is the second of two webinars we've been doing, um, looking to explain this topic uh, about archaeology and planning. And um, what's uh, important to know is the first session we did was very much aimed at those people directly employed um, in, uh, in the planning process and, and delivering archaeology through the planning process. This webinar is actually aimed at a much broader audience. So again, what we're who might not be directly uh, employed within um, the commercial archaeological sector or the planning sector um, to actually understand what role advocacy uh, might play in looking at future changes coming forwards around archaeology and planning. And we're going to do that by having a couple of um, presentations from, from Rob and, and Jan using CIFA and Historic England's planning case studies work that was completed several years ago, looking at really good examples of how the planning process delivers archaeological projects. We're then going to break into a panel Q&A, um, and I'm really delighted that we've got three people um, uh, joining um, Jan and Rob and myself uh, on the panel to actually field your questions. First of all, we have Sadie Watson from MOLA. Sadie's a UK RI future leaders researcher, and she's particularly interested in and looking at the public benefit of archaeology through the development-led process. Next, we have Bill Klemperer, Principal Inspector of Ancient Monuments from Historic England. Um, Bill's directly involved in giving planning advice on um, archaeological issues for Historic England, and hopefully Bill's going to bring that national perspective along with us, with him about why archaeology and planning is such an important relationship. And finally, we have Chloe Duckworth. For, Chloe's obviously from Newcastle University, but she's also one of the presenters of the Great British Dig. And she actually was one of the co-founders of Dig for Archaeology. And what we're going to have hopefully be exploring issues with, with, with Chloe around is that public voice of archaeology. How do we get people involved and engaged and actually starting to talk about the things that they find important around archaeology? Why, why does this matter? Well, um, just as a bit of background, the, the Council of British Archaeology and CIFA actually have a memorandum of understanding about our advocacy work. And what we're trying to do in actually looking at advocacy is um, start to understand the different forms of advocacy and how we can bring both, well, I, I would describe two sides of advocacy together to give a more comprehensive view. So first of all, there's direct advocacy, direct advocacy to government responding on um, planning legislation changes, responding on government um, requests for information. And again, this is done normally through someone like Rob, who's specifically in, in, employed to deal with advocacy issues like that. Um, we test the, the mood of the sector and then we actually write responses. It's, it's quite a formulaic approach. It also includes using direct contact with ministers or MPs um, to actually get the, the point of view of archaeology across. And indeed, as Rob will talk about in his presentation, we've, we've, we've not been unsuccessful about that in the past. Indeed, uh, many would argue that the, the very foundation of archaeology in the planning process at right now is because of that sort of early advocacy. But there's another type of advocacy as well, which relates to the, just the general voice of archaeology. How is archaeology stood by, understood by the wider population? How can actually people stand up for what they believe in around archaeology? And for me, certainly as the director of the Council of British Archaeology, that's a really important aspect. These two things don't exist in isolation. Actually understood well and deployed well, they can be very, very effective techniques of actually um, securing the outcomes that we actually might want. And certainly, as we know, 
things are going to change. The, the, the fact that uh, the government wants to change things is, is readily apparent, and we need to be ready to actually give the best sort of advice we can to government and actually use all the tools at our disposal to actually get the voice of archaeology across. And really, that's what this session is actually about. It's honing in to get us all to understand what it is we can do and how we can actually get that collective sense better embedded in some of our advocacy work. So really, you don't need to hear too much more from me at this stage. What I really want to do now is get um, both Rob and Jan to do their presentations as a way of providing a platform for the conversation that's going to come on, hopefully, through the Q&A and chat. So first of all, please use the Q&A. Don't wait until the end. If you've got a question, put it in the Q&A. We'll get it captured and then we'll do our best to try and make sure we don't forget it and bring it back up. Um, the chat function's there as well, but again, would prefer you to use the Q&A um, as we're running through the, the presentations, please. So I'm really delighted to ask Rob now to set up to the microphone and um, introduce um, his case studies. And Rob's going to look at, he's, he's going to cover quite a lot in what he's going to look at. He's going to do a little bit of the history of archaeology and planning. He's going to talk a little bit about how effective we've been bring in the advocacy arguments, bring in the advocacy conversations, and he's going to throw a couple of polls at you. So Rob, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Neil. Yeah, so just first thing I'm going to do is, is launch the first poll. Um, these are just a couple of questions that we're going, to, we're going to ask you, just mostly for our benefit, really, to, um, to see, you know, this question is, is, what do you want to get out of today's session? Um, the audience that we've got today is very varied. Um, so uh, the options you've got are mostly to hear about uh, evidence from uh, the case studies projects and about how the system works, uh, mostly to hear about current advocacy um, and, uh, and updates from, from CIFA. See both seven out of seven say that so far, so that's pretty good. Um, and if it's something else, then click that and feel free to drop that in the in the chat box so that we so we know what what it is that you you've come here for. Um, I'll leave that running for a few minutes, but I will uh, crack on with my presentation in the meantime. Um, so uh, as Neil says, in the next 20 minutes, um, I'm just going to take a short look about uh, where we sit in the development of archaeology's inclusion in planning, um, and then uh, look at um, some of the little bits of advocacy that um, have gone on over the last 10 years of planning reform, looking at some of the agendas that have driven that change and uh, where we think it's likely to go next. Um, so there's a whole presentation in the subject of how archaeology came into the planning system. Um, but before 1990, there was no comprehensive government policy for, um, for archaeology in the system. Uh, where developments impacted known archaeological sites, uh, there was a, a largely volunteer effort to, quote unquote, rescue um, whatever was about to be destroyed by the, by the bulldozers. Um, in 1989, uh, the, uh, there were a few key planning uh, cases which um, catalyzed a change, the, the most notable of which was the rediscovery of the Shakespearean Rose Theatre in Southwark. Um, and this was a major turning point in a long term effort by archaeological campaigners to get archaeology recognized as something which the planning system ought to be mindful of. Um, in uh, uh, the, so the, the case of the Rose Theatre, it spurred government to adopt a new policy um, that required developers to, to take account of archaeology on their development sites. Um, and uh, what that did is that it required development, the developers to assess the likely impact of their development on any archaeological remains on the site, whether they are known or hitherto unknown. Um, and therefore, it kind of brought about a range of new approaches for how to avoid harm to archaeological assets, um, preserving things where possible in situ, um, and minimizing uh, any harm that couldn't be avoided. So um, any archaeological remains that, that couldn't be preserved in situ physically would be preserved by record. Um, now, this was subject to the principle of polluter pays, so developers for the first time had to fund these, um, these archaeological works as a matter of policy. And over the next 20 years, this process 
really revolutionized the way that um, the vast majority of archaeology has been done in um, across the UK, but we're talking about England today, but in, so in England, um, to the point that when that now the vast majority of archaeological work that is done is done through this development led route. Um, it's really changed and helped us improve our understanding of the past in a huge number of different areas. And I would recommend that you take a look at the Historic England report that I've linked in the slide here. Um, the slides are going to be shared with you afterwards so you can so you can click the links at your leisure. Um, this sea change for planning and archaeology led to the development also of um, a comprehensive nest network of specialists, county archaeologists within local planning authorities. Um, whose job it was to advise on development management and the development, um, and, and it also led to the development of sites and monuments records, which are now known as historic environment records across the country, essentially the repositories of all of the data that we produce through this system and through other means. And these remain critical tools for advising developers and both planning and understanding the um, archaeological resource today. Um, so, as I say, over 20 years from 1990, that system grew, it became embedded. Today, development-led archaeology is a specialist subject that manages the process of ensuring good outcomes for the public from this development process, um, and also delivering a service that is helpful to the, the client, the developer, as much as possible. Uh, for instance, by giving them good value for money in um, for the for the money that they're expending on archaeology and helping them to manage their process of getting that development out on budget on time and all of those kinds of uh, considerations. Um, after 20 years, uh, in 2010, that 1990 policy was updated to take better account of some of the things that um, had grown in the in the, the archaeological world since 1990, chief amongst them, um, this idea that the reason for doing this work was so that it could uh, to generate public benefit. It wasn't just enough to go in, record the archaeology, pack it off into an archive and call it done. Um, the new policy, Planning Policy Statement 5, introduced uh, a focus on public benefit outcomes, not simply that preservation by record approach as it was envisaged in the 90s. Um, and this public benefit aspect is really vital. It's something that we're going to cover in the Q&A. Um, uh, but for now, it's my job to stick with the dry policy stuff. Um, so what's going on? Uh, Interestingly, PPS5 was the was virtually the very last piece of policy published under the new Labour government in May 2010. And since the advent of the decade of conservative led government in 2010, we've seen a real drastic change in the way that planning has been perceived by government. Um, and I think in that time, it's fair to say that there has been nearly constant change um, since the very start of that decade. Uh, these are just some of the consultations, reports, pieces of policy, pieces of legislation that we've seen over this time. In fact, none of these documents on the screen go back beyond 2015, let alone 2010. And it wasn't even a remote, remotely the deepest dive I could have done to find all of the things that we've been dealing with. So what I'm trying to say basically is that there's been an unprecedented period of change to the planning system over this last decade or so. Um, throughout this change, there has been a pretty consistent government agenda um, with strong trends towards building more houses, um, strong trends towards removing what government sees as perceived barriers to uh, delivery of, of quick, efficient how, um, uh, planning, which delivers this, uh, this development in the right uh, quantity. Um, and removing sort of planning controls that it, can, it sees as constraints. Uh, it's also been about uh, pressurising local authorities to increase permission rates, putting in place other metrics of performance in planning service delivery. Um, and generally, these things have focused blame for ongoing failures of planning on the planning system, on red tape, um, on the, the planners themselves. So one key deregulatory policy has been the expansion of permitted development rights. Um, these are basically uh, uh, tools which increase the amount of development that can happen without full planning application, without full planning assessment. 
Um, originally, permitted development was supposed to be reserved for development, which was completely uncontroversial. But what we're seeing more and more now is that it's being applied more broadly to much more development. Um, and over the decade, there have been many voices that have criticised this creeping permitted development rights, including, you know, uh, government voices like select committees, uh, sorry, not government voices, political voices like select committees, independent and government reviews, all of which have cited evidence and conclusions supporting the view that planning is really not the problem. It's not over-regulation that's stopping planning delivering the good outcomes. Um, and, uh, you know, instead looking at, at other aspects of the system which are causing issues, which I won't dwell on at the moment. Um, but for permitted development rights, I mean, you might have, for instance, come across the headlines of things like flats with no windows um, and other examples of, of developments which planning departments are out there desperate to stop because of the bad outcomes that this, that this system is producing, but they can't. So, um, as well as trying to simplify the system, the deregulate to speed up strategy, there's also been um, a, a, some mixed messages around that. And government has been guilty of supplementing this simplified system with generous layers of extra complexity. Um, so, for example, government is also as, as um, they, they've introduced new consent routes over the decade, things like permission in principle. Um, which gives development on particular types of land like brownfield sites an ability to sidestep some planning controls, essentially receiving some permission up front um, and dealing with the, the detailed assessment later. Um, our argument is that policies like this have a tendency to sacrifice sustainable development on the altar of speed and certainty for developers. And while that speeding up goal has been the ultimate priority of government, the policies haven't necessarily been terribly successful at achieving it. So what you've got is a situation where you've applied higher and harsher targets for housing numbers, approval rates, timescales for processing applications um, on planning on planners without actually seeing the, 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 the benefits that that has brought to um, your intended goals. And all of this has been happening in an era where over the first eight, nine years of Conservative government from 2010, you've seen 33% cuts to local authority budgets, including to archaeology services. Um, so these two quotes are just from um, the Rainsford Review of Planning, a major um, independent review uh, published in 2017. It just points to these, uh, these issues. Uh, it's not just, not just us saying this. Um, so just a couple of these quotes, it's common view among government that planning is at best slow, cumbersome, bureaucratic and an obstacle to getting things done, or at worst, the enemy of enterprise that needs to be dismantled. Um, and the second quote is basically just saying that if the government's reform objective was simplification, it's very hard to see how this has been secured. So what has the impact on archaeology been? Uh, well, Throughout this period of deregulation, what I would say is that archaeology has very rarely, if ever, been an explicit target um, to cut back, to sideline, to do less of. However, the way that archaeology works and slots into that planning system has often put it at odds with the intention of the reformers. Uh, so what exactly is happening? Uh, essentially, taking development out of traditional planning routes removes or reduces the potential to undertake timely archaeological evaluation that's requisite to the success of provisions that have existed in those archaeology policies since 1990. Um, so this slide shows the normal process. Uh, you get several stages of discussion and evaluation of what heritage assets are going to be impacted by development. Then a process of determination that, that uh, agrees appropriate proposals before planning permission is granted. Many of the deregulatory changes that we've seen essentially move that granting of permission ahead of the consideration of uh, the necessary information. So you're forced to make a decision before you've looked at that information or looked at it, all of that information. And that's bad because it encourages developers to treat archaeology as an issue that can be dealt with at the end of the process. And that means an increased likelihood that there will be unexpected discoveries late on in the process that cost more, that are harder to deal with. 
um, it means then increased likelihood that by the time those discoveries are made, your options to amend the development pro proposals will be limited because your architect will have already de developed the plans, the site materials will already have been ordered. Um, and so you don't get the opportunity to build in public benefits like positive design changes to the development that enhance the significance of those heritage assets by leaving um, uh, uh, an, an image of them in the, in the new developments and things like that. Um, so there are, oops, there are some workarounds for these kinds of things, um, but they're not perfect solutions either. So you could ask the local planning authority to put more money into assessing sites upfront um, before the developer gets involved. But where does that money come from? Um, some permitted development rights have uh, routes called prior approval, which you might need to say, uh, how about this development? Is this OK? Um, but what those approval routes don't have is the same scope of evidence that you get through a full planning application. So you still don't have enough in, um, information to make the right decision at that stage. Um, ultimately, I think that these archaeological processes are just not off. They're just not well enough understood by those who are high up in government, who are setting the agenda for planning change and designing many of the new mechanisms. Um, so heritage protections fall through the cracks. And this is what sets the scene for the advocacy challenge. So I've pulled up a couple of examples about how we've been advocating um, against this change um, over the last decade. The first one is national planning policy framework, which um, sort of was the, the, the intention setter for the, uh, for the government in, in 2010. It, it was designed to reduce a thousand pages of planning policy down to 50. Um, and the first draft was accused widely of being a developer's charter through its presumption in favour of development. Um, uh, uh, what happened uh, in terms of advocacy is we pushed back to try and uh, get the sustainable um, inserted back into that process. And this happened largely through a huge public campaign led by the National Trust and other large charities who you know, went after this policy in the, on the front pages of the newspaper, blazoning images of LA style sprawl um, through the newspapers. And it was an extremely successful public campaign. Many, many thousands of people got involved to uh, champion the, the concerns that the likes of the National Trust had. This was extremely successful and organizations like CIFA, CBA and others in the archeology span sector were able to negotiate access to government and government officials under the covering fire that came from this campaign. And against a cracking resolve in the face of this criticism, in the end, we managed to preserve all of the key historic environment policies that the previous system had put in place and sustain, um, re retain sustainable development as that golden thread in the policy. What came out was actually pretty good and has served us well over the decades since. Um, the next, next example was the 2016 Housing and Planning Act. Um, this was a really interesting one, emphasizing that simplicity equals complexity argument in the new planning agenda. Um, and this act sought to introduce several new mechanisms that were essentially designed to sidestep the planning consideration that I talked about before. Um, CIFA and other organizations worked during this process to try and get the attention of government um, officials to, to, to explain the concerns that we had about what that would do to archaeological processes. Um, in the end, in this case, our lobbying only extracted pretty vague promises in parliamentary debate that these um, issues could be taken account of that weren't terribly satisfactory to us. Uh, as it happened, these policies have not been very well taken up. Developers have not liked these new routes. And so there's a weakness in the, in the planning system that hasn't truly been exploited and we haven't really seen any uh, major negative effects from. Um, and my final example is that of the Neighbourhood Planning Bill. Now, this um, uh, piece of legislation, the most relevant policy, was the intention to crack down on what government deems to be unnecessary planning con, um, conditions which happened before um, a development could start. And these are essentially the mechanism that are used to secure archeological work when planning permission is granted. Um, the concern for us was that the bill didn't explain what was deemed necessary and what wasn't. Uh, so we worried that they were going to include archeological conditions in that uh, the, what was unnecessary. Now, 
in this case, what was really interesting about the advocacy is that our path to influence in government was smoothed by the success of a really, um, uh, a really interesting public campaign, archaeological public campaign. Basically, a petition was started by an archaeology student and it really took off on social media. Folks um, on Twitter and uh, in, the, in the wider digital world started to inundate the planning minister with concerns and complaints about how he was destroying archaeology and this kind of took him by surprise because he didn't realize that he was just trying to destroy archaeology and didn't really want to destroy archaeology but what this did was it helped um, organizations like CIFA to get its foot very firmly in the door to go and discuss how he could go about making the right assurances to make sure that that um, policy didn't have too many negative effects and indeed that was successful. So on some more current matters, um, for the last couple of years, we've been working to inform a proposed new planning bill. Um, these proposals took on a pretty radical flavor when Boris Johnson became prime minister, and it was clear that he wanted to pursue a major shakeup to, to, the, to the way planning works. In short, what Johnson wanted was a more rules-based and less discretionary system. So rather than each development being assessed by a planning authority, um, and then granted permission or not. Johnson's plan was that local plans would basically set out what development should go where, and then there would be far less discretion in considering whether a specific individual application should be permitted or not. Essentially, that permission in principle would be writ large across huge areas of the country. Um, in and of itself, that kind of system wouldn't have been necessarily terribly bad. It, it works in other parts of the uh, other parts of the world, um, but what it would have required was a complete redesign of the processes that we use to assess heritage assets with archaeological interest in the planning process. Um, so, long story short, CFA, CBA, and other partners in the sector work closely with Historic England and did a ton of work to get inside government's development of these plans early on in order that we could influence um, some positive solutions to the, to the potential problems that a new approach to planning was going to open up. Now, I've got to stop myself going into too much detail about stuff which is now in the past, because as it stands, we're in a bit of a limbo with what's going to happen with these reforms. Um, there was a cabinet reshuffle in um, September last year. Michael Gove has been brought into the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities, which is taking over the, the plans here. Um, and basically, Gove was having a rethink. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism of these plans come from inside the Conservative Party um, and uh, some heated debate about the loss of local control over, over development. Um, our current intelligence tells us that um, Michael Gove is, is looking to um, completely scrap the, the, the idea of having a zonal approach. We're looking at a much less radical set of reforms that are probably on the agenda at the moment, and there won't be any specific planning legislation this year. Um, however, what we are expecting is that various bits of planning reform are going to be tidied up in the levelling up and regeneration bill that we're going to expect to be announced in May this year. Um, so uh, at this stage, it's pretty unclear what's going to happen to any of the archaeological topics that we were discussing with government officials last year, for example, making historic environment records a statutory requirement. Um, the major concern here is that with the white paper, we at least seemed like we had a genuine opportunity to think creatively about how to build a sustainable system that brought in positive gains for archaeology in this new structure. Whereas this potential new approach is likely to be more by the back door to have similar effects in terms of continuing to try and speed up planning and chop down regulation, but without the ability to have this, these innovative new solutions to problems. Uh, and just as an illustration of that point, this is a tweet by Dominic Cummings. He's essentially trolling a former front bench Tory with claims that they've already stuck, snuck through loads of um, planning reforms without parliamentary scrutiny through secondary legislation and, and other means that are harder to, to, um, to advocate against. Now, Dominic Cummings is gone from government. There's a new planning minister who has been put in post specifically to look after those um, concerns coming from backbench conservatives. But what we would do well to remember in the archaeology sector as we consider advocacy is that 
government's resolve to see these planning changes brought in has not been put to bed here. We have already seen this year um, government making a raft of temporary permitted development right changes permanent, and there's still a lot of influence that think tanks that push an anti-planning agenda, um, a lot of influence that they have with government at the moment. Okay, so where does that leave us on advocating for archaeology and planning? Well, um, it might feel like we're not in a great position to judge where we go next without a firm legislative instrument to get our kind of teeth into. But hopefully what my sort of sketching out of that longer term process has shown you is that we do have the tools to respond to opportunities and threats that are presented through this constantly shifting planning system. Um, firstly, what I want to give you the impression of is that, as Neil says, the sector has a good track record of achieving positive influence across these, these types of planning changes. More and more um, CIFA, CBA, Algeo, um, other organizations in the archeology span sector have a, a, a good respect with government advisors and, and a helpful um, relationship. More than ever, this means that we're able to take proactive discussions, uh, steps to get in, involved in discussions. And government, of course, has really good advisory relationships with its lead advisors, Historic England. Um, now, this influence is levered through several ways, like built, you know, maintaining those networks and those good relationships, working with wider allies in the nature sector, the wider construction sector. Um, and the, 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 the wheels are greased by being positive and productive as much as we can, uh, not perennially kind of outraged at the, the latest affront to, to, our, to our values, to our, um, our, our judgments of where we should be going. Um, the final lever, though, is the wider advocacy environment. And three of my four examples, and all three of the successful ones, included really important elements of public campaigning. And this has been a vital part of the advocacy ecosystem for, for many years. In fact, you know, the early stages of getting archaeology involved in planning was really led by that voluntary um, uh, um, endeavor. And um, and so this campaigning isn't necessarily just about, you know, your traditional activism, signing petitions or writing to your MPs or whatever else. It's also about being able to demonstrate and communicate the great archaeology that we do to tell people about it. If you're working in archaeology uh, to invite um, people who watch people like Chloe on the television to to say why archaeology matters to them. Um, so it's about having that positive message and using it in the right ways to enhance this ecosystem for advocacy. Uh, right, I've run out of time and I'm going to stop there and hand over to Jan, who's going to tell you a bit about um, the planning case studies project. But before I do that, I will pop up the next poll. Um, this one will just ask you, whether you had heard of the planning case studies project before. Um, don't worry if you really haven't, don't worry if you're not a CIFA member or even a CBA member. Um, we recognize that you may not have come across these projects before, but just for our records, really helpful to know um, whether people have known this before. And Jan, I will use that minute while people are filling the poll in to ask you to share your slides. Thank you, Rob. Um, coming up now, I hope you can tell me, Rob, if we're good to go. That's, that's brilliant. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Rob. Archaeology and Planning Case Studies Project. I'm going to talk this afternoon about why we undertook the work, um, broadly what the scope of the project it was and what the content of the um, resources available to you are now. And at the end, I'm going to um, signpost some future events and other material on similar themes that you might find useful. So starting with the genesis of the project, um, we designed the project against um, that background of increasing change in the planning system that Rob's talked about. So actual change or very strong signposting from government that change was on the horizon. And the other key factor was the way local authorities were changing. 
the um, reduction in resources and the increasing absence of a specialist advisor in local authorities. And that specialist advice, of course, is key to ensuring that the, the planning policy is properly Im implemented and that local authorities are able to consider the archeological implications of proposed development. We felt we had a good system for managing archeology span development and a system which is particularly important, of course, for managing the 95% or more of the archeological resource not protected by law. So not scheduled or, or not a listed structure. And in the last 30 years or so, since um, archaeology or archaeological policy became incorporated into the planning system, uh, as Rob um, outlined, there has been a um, quite successful way of managing archaeological sites and development and a consequent vast increase in knowledge um, from new archaeological sites and information and, and consequent public benefit. But when we've been working on advocacy, um, when we've been talking to government and others about why key aspects of this planning system need to be retained, we felt that we really needed hard evidence. Where's the evidence that the system works? Where's the evidence for what it delivers? And that was really the origin of the Archaeology and Planning Case Studies project, doing some work so that we would have really specific evidence to hand to support the advocacy that CIFA's, CIFA and, and others in the sector were undertaking. So the Archaeology and Planning Case Studies project was, um, was designed, it was funded by Historic England and supported by Victoria Thompson, who was then um, Historica's Historic England's lead on planning. Um, the work was carried out by myself and, and by Stuart Bryant, working as consultants for CIFA. And we had three project partners from the sector, so Algeo, CBA and FAME, all signed up to assist on the project. Our objectives were, were pretty straightforward. They were to um, illustrate how key aspects of current planning policy works for archaeology and what might happen if these key policies were to be removed or were weakened. And we chose four main themes, each of them a key aspect of the system that might change or, or had started to change as a result of changes in government policy. And I'm going to look at those um, elements that we chose to study on the next slide and also why we chose them. So Rob's talked about the really important early stage of predetermination assessment and evaluation by which um, archaeologists find out what heritage assets are present on a development site, look at their significance and look at the impact of proposed development. Because of the introduction of commission and principle and because of the broadened range of permitted development, we were concerned that it would be less easy to carry out predetermination and assessment and evaluation. And so we wanted to show how important it is and how successful it is. Secondly, um, pre-commencement planning conditions. These are the conditions most commonly used, and they are very, very commonly used, to stipulate programmes of archaeological investigation, analysis, publication and archiving in advance of development. And this theme was chosen because of the government's interest in restricting the use of pre-commencement conditions and possibly getting rid of them altogether. Our third theme that we looked at was the premature discharge of planning conditions by local authorities. That sounds terribly technical and terribly dull, but it's really important that those pre-commencement planning conditions stay in force until archaeological projects are completed. And if local authorities discharge them early, then we're often left with incomplete projects, typically sites that aren't properly written up and published. And we chose this because government was very keen to introduce, introduce what's called deemed discharge, 
So allowing um, developers to have conditions signed off after a specified period and not necessarily before it was checked whether an archaeological project or piece of work had been satisfactorily con concluded. Our fourth thing was access to specialist local authority advice. So were the cases where um, there had been no specialist advice in place and what and as a consequence. And we wanted to look at this because of the very severe um, restriction, sorry, reduction um, in the uh, advice available to local authorities in some areas as a result of resource reductions. And lastly, we thought we would try to look at the impact of planning um, reforms to date. Um, what had happened when mission principle had been introduced? Um, could we actually assess the impact of change? So um, with those themes, we went ahead and asked for case studies from the public, private and the voluntary sector. That is um, development proposals with archaeological implications whose case histories illustrated any of the themes we've chosen. So, for example, um, successful evaluations or the converse, cases where evaluation for whatever reason couldn't be carried out. Examples of the use of planning conditions. Examples of cases where there was no local authority advisory in place. As a result, we got 171 case studies submitted. So a really long list of, um, of material. And we reduced this to 118 because those are the ones that match the selected themes. The vast majority came from local government curators with a small number from the commercial sector. Um, we then uh, looked in detail at those case studies and we collected additional information by reviewing what was available online by local authority websites, um, looking at archaeological reports such as DBAs, evaluations, etc. We got a very good range of material, and as you can see from the table on the screen, um, it covered all regions of England, which is great. However, it's not a statistical sample of archaeology and planning casework in the country as a whole, because of course the cases were self-selected by our respondents. They did, however, include most types of development, so housing, minerals, roads, flood alleviation, householder development, and both rural and urban cases. It was interesting that as we compiled the results um, and researched the case studies, we realised that there were many aspects of cases that were commercially um, sensitive and um, people were concerned about confidentiality. And I'm going to return to this briefly at the end of my talk. So don't worry about trying to gather all of what's on the screen in front of you at the moment. This is just an example to give you a sort of mental picture of what the case studies uh, contain. This is case study number 12 from TAME in Oxfordshire. And we'll see some pictures of this case study in a minute. So typically, a um, couple of pages of text for each case study. And you can see on the left-hand side in that column, sort of things that you can find out from each study. So um, first of all, the planning scenarios, we call them. The theme that this particular case study illustrates, you can see the heritage assets affected, what type of development was proposed, what was known before the development came along. Um, you can track the archeological and planning processes and you can look at the outcomes, whether they are archeological, um, or there are other public benefits, such as um, public engagement or, or new or changed um, work practices. Turning now to, to look at the results in a little bit more detail, and I'll do it by 
our themes. So this is theme A, predetermination and assessment and evaluation. We've got 106 cases in the database from the project, and this includes 43 cases of the effective use of assessment and evaluation to gather information at a very, very early stage. Interestingly, um, 22 of these cases are on what I call blank sites. So sites where nothing was known beforehand, before evaluation, nothing on the HDR. And yet these 22 blank sites produced eight sites assessed as being as nat of national importance. So I think that undermines how important it is to be able to undertake assessment and evaluation early before development proposals are finalised. The case you can see on the, on the screen is, is case 46 of Pamington and Gloucestershire. And you can see there outlined in Rome, the geophysical survey results showing a completely new um, Iron Age and Roman settlement identified early at evaluation stage. And that allowed this complex um, settlement to be excluded from the housing development that eventually went ahead on that site. So out of all these 106 cases um, where um, evaluation found archaeology, redesigned development nevertheless proceeded in most cases um, because the development was redesigned in some way and very often because there was associated archaeological investigation and recording. So in other words, the development became acceptable through um, the uh, process of assessment, evaluation and consideration of how the development could be modified. My second evaluation case study on the slide um, is Gloucester Castle. And this is a fantastic example of how early evaluation identified nationally important remains of Gloucester's second castle. And you can see the remains of the keep, which are the two diagonal masonry lines on the screen, sitting underneath the brick, red brick foundations of the later prison buildings. So this evaluation found not only important nation, nationally important archeological remains, but it allowed the development to be designed in such a way as to part preserve and, and part display these archaeological remains. We also found 22 cases where there was no or, or inadequate evaluation and these cases graphically illustrated how lack of evaluation can produce real problems, so significant additional costs or delays for the developer and poor outcomes for heritage. And finding those sort of cases inevitably prompts the question of why do things go wrong? And um, in many cases, it's simply a failure to ensure that early evaluation happens comprehensively enough on big schemes. So for example, evaluation is only undertaken when works are underway as part of a, a scheme during development. And that leads very often to a poorer archaeological strategy, delays, unanticipated costs. Sometimes on small developments, so just a few houses, local authorities might be unwilling to implement the advice to evaluate, but it can lead to real problems during development. And there are many other reasons. Sometimes it's a poor quality desk-based assessment that really doesn't flag the potential of the site properly or failure to consult the specialist advisor and so on, many reasons. But interestingly, I would say that the problem is almost always not the policy, but the way it's implemented. Our second theme, theme B, looked at the use of pre-commencement planning conditions to secure archeological investigations. And we got 77 cases in our database of successful use. And without those conditions, those really important archaeological planning conditions, the development wouldn't have been acceptable. Problems in six cases where the development, sorry, where the condition couldn't be used. And I'm going to show you two 
uh, typical examples. Here's case study 12 again from Tame in Oxfordshire, which we saw a few minutes ago. And here are some um, photos of the archeological work in progress. So um, found by early evaluation and then excavated through the use of a pre-commencement planning condition. Um, a new Neolithic causeway enclosure and Iron Age and Roman settlement as well. So a really important multi-period new site. And secondly, Crediton in Oakhampton, case study 64, where evaluation next to the Roman fort found an extramural Roman settlement. And this was um, excavated. Again, the excavation program secured by that all important pre-commencement archaeological planning condition. Um, theme C, moving on to my third theme, premature discharge of archaeological planning conditions. Plenty of examples there of um, cases, 17 in total, where um, those critically important archaeological planning conditions were discharged too early and post-excavation programmes remained incomplete. Um, some of our examples, some of our cases also demonstrated how local authorities use those conditions to persuade or to compel developers to ensure that those programmes of work were completed um, and uh, full publication and archiving uh, came to fruition. My last theme, um, absence of specialist local authority advisors, uh, we had some quite good examples of where um, a local authority had not had access to archaeological advice in-house and that led to problems all the way through the planning process. So for example, uh, planning applications were not screened against the HER, there was no initial appraisal, um, there was no assessment or evaluation or there was no pro proper specification of archaeological investigation. Um, problems of all types and leading to bad outcomes. Um, I should say while this slide is on the screen that the graphics come from um, a, a report, Archaeology and Development Management, produced for Algeo, Association of Local Government Archaeological Officers, and that has some great stats on planning applications and local authorities and it's well worth um, a look at if you want to follow up this aspect. Lastly, um, just a word about the impact of planning reforms. We did try to research this in the project, but actually we found that um, the reforms had come really too recently for there to be good evidence of how they were affecting um, archeology span and development. We do, of course, however, have excellent proxy evidence, as you might call it, because all those evaluations which produced completely new heritage assets, some of national importance, could perhaps not have been undertaken um, if those developments had been permitted development and they did not have to go through the standard process um, associated with the planning application. Or if, for example, pre-commitment planning conditions could not have been used to secure some of those really good programmes of archaeological work, like the work at TAME or the work at Crediton, for example. So I'm going to move on now to a couple of slides, um, just to uh, talk briefly about the key messages from the project. And, and two aspects, really, key messages for advocacy. And I think the, the messages from the project are really clear. There's really good confirmatory evidence from the archaeology and planning case studies project that if our existing archaeology policies in the national planning policy framework are implemented, and if that implementation is properly resourced, the system works well. So if we're looking forward to um, change in the planning system, if not to an actual planning bill, then I think we can pinpoint the key aspects of the current system which need to be retained for the future if we're going to be able to continue to manage archaeology and development in the future. 
And although this project was very much about policy and process, then I should also note here the scale and importance of new discoveries of heritage assets, which the project threw up as well. Fantastic um, new evidence about our past. And I think those positive conclusions and positive messages are also apparent in many other recent and not so recent publications. So whether we're looking at um, the archaeology in the PPG 16 era, which looked at the first 10 years post PPG 16, a publication not produced, not published actually until 2019, or the historic England, um, building the future, transforming our past, which looked um, over a broader time scale at development led archeology span in England and its outcomes, then both of those other publications uh, provide lots more evidence of how the system really works pretty well. And I think in terms of new knowledge about the past, then the, some of the big um, synthesizing projects like the Roman Rural Settlement Project or the English Landscapes and Identities Project show how this evidence about our past from development-led archeology span can contribute new narratives and a new understanding of our past. So the other element of the messages really this is messages for professional archaeologists, for those of us engaged in archaeology. And there's a lot here that came out of the project. I'm only going to mention a few of them, um, but you can see the rest in the report. First of all, um, there's a lot of difference in the way policy is implemented across England. And I think we really need to get better at sharing best practice and ways to deliver more public benefit. Some projects are really engaging with communities and with the public, but not everybody is, and there's fantastic scope there for more and better work. We can do better things in some of our um, processes and our desk-based assessments, and we've got lots of material to look at how evaluation works, um, how our techniques work, and how we can design um, better and more productive evaluations. Confidentiality, we need to have more and better open discussion of good practice of the problems in, in what we are doing, um, in new approaches, and we need to facilitate those um, conversations between pro professional groups so we learn from current practice. And lastly, I just mentioned local authority services. We really need, do need to identify and track those areas that don't have specialist archeological advice with good follow-up action at national level, because that specialist advice in the system is really essential. So to conclude, what next? This concluding slide really is about what's available now and what's forthcoming. So first of all, the all of the project materials, so 118 case studies and an analytical report are available on the CIFA website. And you can search, you can look at um, examples of good evaluation, you can look at um, these archeological planning conditions, et cetera, et cetera. And there is a CIFA summary publication on the project, which is currently um, being prepared. You can look at the Historic England um, website for the Heritage Online Debate series. Number 11, Archaeology and Planning, has a number of short articles on the project, but also more broadly on themes in archaeology and planning. Rob and I are going to be running a CIFA conference session, 21st of April. Um, when um, we might be a bit clearer about what's happening on change in the planning system, or conversely, we might still be waiting. Um, there is uh, a new Historic England advice note on planning and archaeology, which is out for consultation at the moment, and it draws um, on the archaeology and planning case studies project. There's quite a lot of material from the um, project in the advice note. It's out for consultation, I think, until 
um, about a month's time. So do look at that via the Historic England website. And lastly, um, looking at our evaluation strategies, how they work and how they can be improved was one of the project recommendations. And I'm pleased to say there is an evaluation strategies project currently in progress um, by CIFA and FAME with consultants WSP, and that will be reporting, <coughs> excuse me, in the next um, couple of months. So thank you to everybody who contributed to and supported the project, especially Historic England who funded the work, and to um, my colleagues who supplied case studies, particularly um, local government staff. Thank you. And I think over to you, Neil. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jan. And thank you, Rob. That was fantastic. Um, what I would like to do now is I would like to ask the panel if they could turn their cameras on, please. Um, thank you. That's great. Hello, Sadie. Hello, Bill. Hi, Chloe. Great. Right. We're starting to get one or two questions in, which is great. But what I'm going to do to start off with is I'm going to turn to each of our panellists and I've uh, devised my own question to get them into the conversation, um, partly on the lines of what I know they're all really interested in and good at talking about. And I actually want to come to Bill first. Uh, I've known Bill for a long time. We used to work to get with each other at Historic England. And Bill, what, what I'd really like to know from you, what, what would you highlight um, about what works well with the current system right now? And what, do you, what then do you think we absolutely need to be retaining moving forwards yeah thanks neil and um thanks yeah jan and um rob for those brilliant presentations i think um i think in general as jan said the system works well but it's not always executed well we know from the i think it was the green balance um consultancy report a few years ago with El Gayo that perhaps a third of local authorities don't really follow the system uh, as as fully as they might and there are um, poor outcomes for archaeology and for wider dissemination of knowledge and public engagement and understanding and uh, access to a sense of place and identity as, as a consequence. So at a time of um, when change is being talked about quite a lot, I think it's really important, uh, it's very important at this time that we emphasise how well in practice the system can work. Um, those of us who were around in 1990 remember you know, being so pleased that for the first time archaeology became a material consideration in the in the management of change, a huge, huge change. And since then, there have been huge strides forward in in knowledge. But we know now as well we can do things better. Um, and um, it, it's time to make make that, those cases as to what can be done better, uh, as our speakers have outlined at this time of um, change or, or um, change being talked about. So. I I'll draw attention to the historic environment advice note currently out for consultation that historic England has has put together. Um, I think it's it's not in its final version, but it's in a version that can go out for consultation. I, I've, I've already spotted a couple of areas where it can be improved. But this is where we want to, I think, concisely set out the responsibilities of of individuals involved in that overall process that we've heard about today. And, and give and support the sector. There's, the sector's been matured and there's been a huge amount of information available. So this document has um, the case studies, which will be really, really helpful, we hope, for uh, people working within the system, not just uh, planning officers and archaeologists, but applicants and, and those interested in, in, in the process generally, but also giving it, it cites good examples of how the relevant um, policies and legislation can be executed really well. It's not something to be frightened about. There's really good outcomes. And um, so I think it's very important that, the, that we recognize that that, that, uh, that document um, is out there. And I'd recommend people to look at that um, out of consultation until April the 25th. At the same time, it is a period of change. I think the government's um, desire to um, streamline the process and get us more upstream as the as the saying goes is 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 going to stay with us despite there being some um, um, there's a lack of focus as to exactly where the planning reforms are going at the moment 
Um, but, um, and in that regard, I think we can harness technology to look more carefully um, at, at areas, at an area-based approach. And of course, that's already happening with things like the rewilding agenda, river basement, catchment plans, flood management, marine wind turbines, um, um, everybody's talking about tree planting. So Historic England is thinking of ways we can work more widely in terms of an area-based approach, putting together all of the systems and, and you know, LIDAR, for instance, has been a game changer. Um, but at the same time, I think what the current system has demonstrated is that that finer, the need for a finer grain assessment process will, will whilst be informed by an area-based approach, can't be, can't entirely replace that finer grain work um, and the advantage of which Jan um, and Rob have outlined today. So I think it's a really good time to emphasize the great successes in the system. Brilliant, thanks, Bill. I mean, you, you you drew on very early in your answer there this this issue around outputs. What what outputs do archaeologists produce? Um, in the flavour of 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 the national planning policy framework, that that's defined as public benefits. Sadie, I wonder, with your background, could you could you come in with this whole issue about the importance of public benefits, how that relates to the creation of public value, and what it is that archaeologists should be articulating when we actually do this work in the context of the advocacy argument? Thanks, no, yeah, I mean, I, I would also agree with what everyone said about how lucky we are to have this system at all, actually, so building on that from that position. Um, I think that the whole idea of public benefit is really difficult to define if you're not a member of the public we're talking about. So we perhaps are the wrong people to be defining that on other people's behalf. And I also think that the way that it's framed in archaeology, so because we work in a public, in a local and national government framework, um, they're public servants and they tell us what to do. So we're contributing to that. And that's enough public benefit. And I think that's really arguable. Um, and we were involved in a very technical and technified practice and the reporting that we submit uh, um, at every stage of the planning system is, as we know, really technical and hard for non-practitioners to, um, to, um, to, to get into really. So I think that the key thing for any planning um, application and more generally really is to work out who, what the public benefit is you're intending to provide. So who are the public that you're intending to provide benefit for? Shouldn't be everybody, it can never be everybody. There's so many different constituents um, of interest uh, and other types of communities that we need to respond to that you need to be really specific at the beginning what benefit you're going to provide. And it may be actually that archeology span is merely an excuse to provide public benefit. It doesn't need to be the main, the whole, focus for that so even sites of, of relatively low significance to us as, as practitioners and professionals may actually contribute hugely to the local community the neighbors around that area and that's something that we we're quite bad at because we think well that's a small site that's that's a 10 grand watch eval or whatever it is um, but actually those projects can be hugely significant to local communities so it, it involves a bit of a rethink of our narrative i think around public benefit brilliant you lots in there i'm just going to bring chloe in first before we try and broaden out some of these these arguments chloe not only do you do archaeology in a university but you're out there in front of a camera you're trying to present it to the public and then you yourself have co-founded a campaign about archaeology what what for you is the real essence of what you're trying to communicate in that process and what do you feel we should be really trying to hone our message around mm. Thanks. I, I think actually Sadie's point that she just made is really important. Um, I mean, what, what I've learned from making the TV show that I'm involved with is, is you know, what again, what, what might be significant to us um, and, 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 you know, what we might consider a significant site or a significant find. Um, if, you, if you watch the expression of somebody who finds a bit of a clay pipe under their garden and, and you know, they're absolutely delighted about it, um, this is, you know, we're, we're, we're incredibly privileged in that sense. And so I think getting, getting a sense of um, that for all of us is really good point that Sadie made, but also I suppose what um, the key thing for me is that um, I think there's just not enough public understanding of how archaeology works in this country. Um, and it, it, we, I would like to see more of that. Um, and I think there's another sort of element to that which is that um uh sorry yeah i'm just sort of losing my train of thought here um but it's it's about kind of um so i you mentioned you know i i work at university as well 
Um, we need to protect the excellent archaeology we have. We need to protect the system that we have, which actually is you know, really good. We have the top four archaeology departments in the world all based in the UK. Um, so I don't think people realise this is something we do really well here necessarily outside of archaeology well maybe even inside archaeology we don't we don't always think of it this way you know but there's so much that we can do to promote the way that we work and and the other side of that for me is just the students our graduates who are taking degrees in archaeology and some of them will go into the field but others won't and those are allies for us in the future and they're also people who we need to support in terms of demonstrating to employers, particularly in other sectors, the amazing transferable skills that archaeology can bring. Um, so getting across to people that if you, you know, I mean, they're quite happy to hire a graduate in history or something, for example. Um, but actually, an archaeology graduate uh, has probably had way more experience of um, problem solving and such things and would make a really good employee so I just for me the whole the whole package is about is about getting across to the general public that this is something we do really well we need to be proud of um, and that an archaeology graduate um, is a fantastic employee uh, and that commercial archaeology exists here and it's really really important essentially that was quite a long answer sorry about that Right, no, no, that 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 that's that's really good, and I think it, it it nicely frames up one of the questions that we've had in the Q and A, which is from Mike, who asked, "What more can we, as in the the audience we've got today, do to support CIFA and the CBA in their advocacy work?" Um, so I'm just going to sort of throw that open, bring Jan and and Will in. So, what more do we think? Other other people, how can people help us in this in this quest to be more effective? Who wants to go first? Rob, you go first. Yeah, so I mean, um, I think there's probably two things. So, so there's there is a there is an aspect of direct support. Um, Mike, I don't know whether you're a CFA or a CBA member, but if you are either or both, then um, you will get communications from from CFA that will tell you about the advocacy work that we're doing. And um, I think if there's a way that we can ask members and indeed non-members to be to kind of you know support the advocacy work that we do more, it's probably about making the best use um, of the democratic process basically you are a constituent um, in a in a in a, an mp's constituency you are um, connected to your local representatives in your local council area and you have opportunities through that to build a relationship with them and you can um, say what you like about mps but in my experience of dealing with them um, they uh, they deeply respect and care about that that relationship between um, a representative and a constituent. So, going to see your MP at a surgery, sending them an email is a genuine um, way to make an impact on that um, on that person. And from every every member of C4 or CBA that writes to them to say, do you know what, archaeology is really important in my life for these reasons. And by the way, my professional institute or the, or the, uh, the Council of British Archaeology have told me this about the new planning reform proposals, and I'm concerned, you have an opportunity to make a connection. You have an opportunity to open that representative to come to speak to us so that we've got allies in the future. Um, so these things might seem like tiny actions, they might seem like things that are inconsequential in the grand scheme of things, but they're really not. Um, uh, it could also be that, you know, you don't politically agree with your, your MP, you voted for the, the other person. Well, that doesn't matter. They still represent you and you still have a relationship to be able to mm. build with them. Um, so there's that. There's all, all kinds of things like that. And you'll find resources on CIFA and CBA's website. We can send out a link with the um, uh, after the session. But there's also an indirect element of it as well. So um, it depend, and that depends on who you are. You know, if you work um, in a in an archaeological company, then then you have opportunities to raise the profile of the work that you're doing or get the message out in a particular way. Design your communication strategies to link in with some of these issues. If you're a, um, a CBA member and you're running an event an event for the Festival of Archaeology, 
have you invited the MP to come to that event to see what you're doing? You know, there are, there are ways that we can do more to champion the great work that is done throughout the archaeology sector. And that directly feeds back into how effective we can be in advocacy. Um, thank you, Rob. Um, I've got a few things I could add to that, but does anyone else want to come in with anything before I do? Jan. I uh, just really, I, I suppose, add to what Rob has said in a way. I had um, a long and, and checkered history in a local authority as a, a local authority specialist advisor and saw um, how elected representatives work from the inside and letters to local councillors do get read and if there are enough of them and um, people make representations then they can influence outcomes so I would say um, get involved through as Rob said the democratic process with your council your um, elected members senior officers and also MPs again talking to my own MP over an archaeological issue um, which was to do with um, post-Brexit agricultural policy, he, he, my MP was very receptive. Um, I went and briefed him on a, a policy matter. You don't have to have a lot of technical information to do that. MPs won't want it. They just want to know what the issue is, that you care about it, and what you would like them to do about it. And in this case, my MP raised the issue through a question in the Commons. And, and that's fantastic. That was um, a, a constituent talking to their MP and the MP taking action. So I would say be vocal. Talk to your elected representatives or your MPs if you've got issues in archaeology that you care about. Um, gather the evidence from CBA, from CIFA, from your own um, sources. And, and go out and make your point. If people, if, if our elected representatives feel that people care in the community about an issue, it will have an impact. Um, thank you, Jan. I think that's really, really, really important. Bill, did you want to come in? Thanks, Neil. Just a, just a quick one um, in response to the question about what um, folks can do to really support and work with the sector, I would just say use your local authority archaeological historic environment services. Um, the historic environment records are much more developed than they were a couple of decades ago. And Historic England, I think, recognises that because we're dealing primarily with the undesignated, that is those sites not protected by law, um, and, their and their management in the process of change, that it's um, these decisions are best taken locally and need to be informed locally. So there's a project at the moment called the uh, Historic Environment Access Strategy, which is involving um, transfer of huge amounts of information to um, principally local authority historic environment records. And they are um, uh, they're a hugely um, uh, interesting and beneficial resource for all sorts of purposes. Of course, very important for planning, but in terms of local involvement in the in the history and archaeology of one's own area uh, they're very very important so do use and support your local services brilliant brilliant thanks bill i think for me one of the really important things around expanding this issue about advocacy as well is we've actually got the pitch the message right and again a lot of what we've been hearing today is about the positivity of archaeology yeah this needs, in many ways, needs to be an, an argument about hope and aspiration. Archaeology does actually deliver for communities, and that's and that's what we need to say. And that actually, we constantly go on to the negative. Everything is doomed. People will start believing that it actually is. So again, one of the really important things is to get out with those positive messages. All the archaeology that's been going going on out there in the commercial sector is done in the name of the public. So in a sense, it belongs to the public. So actually asking questions about what's going on, being interested when you see hoardings up and you see development actually happening is really important because the ability to transfer that knowledge into the local community becomes more and more important. And again, there are I think there's a whole area of, of, of issues that might develop, again, working with universities and local research de delivered by universities, where you start to develop this much greater sense 
of impact from 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 the work that that actually archaeologists do. So I think getting getting your conversation right and just wanting to talk about it, it is really important that, that you can do that and you feel empowered to do that. And again, what's interesting is when Rob and I are talking is actually how do we start, if you like, to balance out these two sides of the advocacy argument. So again, we use the memorandum with CIFA, the CIFA to do some of that harder direct to government advocacy. And what the CBA are trying to do with the Festival of Archaeology, the Archaeological Achievement Awards, is create platforms where we can capture this much broader sense of mm. public engagement and public value around the archaeology that's actually happening. And we work with universities, um, archaeological units, consultants, a lot to actually help get that message across. So again, if you want to do something, attend a Festival of Archaeology event, um, because that's a way we can then present that back to government. And I, you know, the statistics on digital engagement for the festival are extraordinary. 16 million people in July last year used the hashtag Festival of Archaeology. That's used the hashtag. Yeah. And we estimated the digital reach was 70 million. Well, if we can turn that into our advocacy arm, then we're on to something very, very powerful. And so it's really important how we start to engage with these things and use those tools for communication that are actually out there. Um, Mike, I also noticed you you are a member of both CIFA and the CBA, so I would now encourage you to make every single one of your uh, members of your family uh, members of the CBA, not quite CIFA, because they're possibly not all professional archaeologists. But again, it's really important how we use that engagement and actually how we present, you know, sessions like this to come back with those arguments. Now, we've got a couple of technical questions that I just want to knock off so that um, people don't think we've, we have just ignore them. Rushan was asking a question about the, the, the London boroughs uh, and the issue of absence specialist advice in local planning authorities. Um, far be it from me to say London's different from the West, rest of the country. In some respects, in terms of planning advice, it is, because obviously there is a Greater London Archaeological Advisory Service that's glass that's actually based within historic England. I know Sadie probably will know much more about London than I will being based there. But again, in a sense, just because you don't necessarily see them in the individual boroughs, there is still there is still archaeological provision within the system. Uh, Sadie, I'm looking for you nodding to see, make sure I've got that right. Um, so again, um, it, it, it's similar but but slightly different. And then Isabel um, asked a question about planning processes and, and uh, changes in development. Uh, are they different in Scotland and Wales? Well, yes, in some senses they are different. We are we are in the scenario of devolved um, home nations now, and what we're seeing gradually over time is that that they're all refining and developing their own separate planning policies. So in Wales, you have the, um, uh, the, the Heritage Consolidation Act, which is looking to bring together ancient monuments to shed legislation, scheduled monument legislation and listed building legislation into, into a consolidated act. And again, in Scotland with MPF 4 I think it is, they're looking to, um, again, take forward their own planning policy in, 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 in a flavour that actually suits their needs. And again, I know that, that Rob and myself, we're, we're across those issues as well. Um, and again, you know, it's part of that need to be incredibly dexterous when it comes to advocacy to try and field all these areas where, where things are actually changing. So hopefully that just knocks um, off those two questions. If Isabel or Rushan want to come back with anything, please do. OK, so I'm just going to I've got a question here. I'm going to open up to everybody. It's from Victoria. How can we engage more with the public, especially when we're on site? The, 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 the long, big conundrum. So who wants to have a go at doing this one first? Sadie, dare I look at you first? Yeah, I mean, I've got a short, short answer and a long answer. The short answer is to argue with the client about why it's a good idea, because they will say no. Um, and it's always about health and safety or confidentiality, neither of which are particularly um, useful as arguments for them to use, because we all know that putting up a scaffold platform takes half a day and costs about 200 quid. And access to site can be very easily provided. Um, the confidentiality aspect is a whole other problem, but, but lots of sites that I work on are visible from neighbouring buildings anyway. So again, it's, it's a bit of a moot point. I think that this is where consultants role is really important. Uh, curators will put, if, they're, if they can, they'll put planning condi um, conditions on the planning application to say that there should be public engagement during the process of excavation but that's quite challenging for them I think key thing and in the work that we've done we've spoken to clients particularly housing developers 
and they all say, why didn't anyone ask us about this before? How do we get more value for money from the archaeology we're providing, we're paying for? They don't really understand why they're doing it. We haven't, no archaeologist has explained it to them sufficiently well for them to get the point. Um, so if you're a consultant and you work and you're commissioning archaeological work through, through your job, then you need to, you're the person that needs to make this argument to the client really early on in the process and say that archaeology will get you good PR, it will, it will provide your neighbours with all the things that Bill mentioned, sense of place. Um, you, can, you can have a myriad of other outputs and, and outcomes that archaeology will provide. But if, if you want to get over that hurdle of talking to the public, then you need to argue with the client and persuade the consultant would be my, my advice. Brilliant, thank you. Anybody else want to come in on that one? Uh, sorry, who uh, was that? Who's, uh, Bill, sorry, everyone jumped around the screen. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah thanks, Sadie. Um, just, just to make the point that um, I mean, public value um, is enhanced by dissemination of information about people sharing in created knowledge, which archaeology is partly about. And the government are very interested, as are its um, arms and bodies like Historic England, in, in actually being able to justify outcomes in terms of public money expenditure. And although we're dealing with, you know, in private development isn't quite the same as, it's not always publicly funded, but the principles I think are transferable between the public and the private sectors and that better outcomes can, um, for investment can be, um, can lead to um, benefits for private developers uh, as, well as, uh, as well as others. So I think there's a, a raft of reasons which we've already mentioned today, which can be explained to them. They needn't be frightened about it. It's often very interesting. They'll get um, very, very often very, positive publicity about it for doing the right thing and in today's um, multimedia world where information is so easily transferred and uh, at the touch of a button that's all, all all the more the case i think um thanks bill i i would certainly add two things that i think we can do much better um convince your uh, developer to use the festival of archaeology as a way of talking about what they're doing and if they need help doing that i will come and talk to them yeah because actually we can provide them a really safe framework, which actually shows them that they're not going to get criticism for doing archeology. span They're going to get actually us saying, thank you for doing the development system properly and allowing us in here and look what we can do with it. Really important role there. And I'm very happy that is what the CBA should be doing. I think the other thing we need to do is pick up that point that's been mentioned a couple of times. For people in local communities, the smallest amount of knowledge can be transformational. So actually, this can be a really, really easy process. Yeah, a hoarding with a window in it where someone can look through can be so engaging with a little sign or a cartoon on the outside of it. We as archaeologists need to do so much more to improve the way we engage different audiences and the way we tell our stories. Um, again, you know, it, it might seem trivial and it might not be the great big knowledge gain, but don't forget, local people's knowledge gain for them is the most important thing. And that can be as simple as knowing the Romans were in their town. It's a start. Uh, so I, I think that I think it's really important when we look at that. And I think Chloe picked it up really well. That That's why things like the Great British Dig are endlessly exciting. Because there's always a new audience to actually find. OK, I'm just going to go back quickly on to the questions. Does anyone else want to come in um, uh, on any of those points? We've got two minutes left before I'm going to call time. Anybody got any final comments they'd like to make from the panel? OK, so. Uh, so I've got Bill's hand up. Bill, do you want to go first? Sadie, do you want no? Bill, do you want to go first? Just a very quick one on on what we can do. Again, I think in terms of engaging people locally, it's brilliant that point is well made. But I think perhaps in the way we, in the future, actually you know formalise and document around the process that that can be improved on as well. Hopefully, as a result of people like Sadie's brilliant work she's doing at the moment, we might think of 
um, there was a document called Management of Archaeological Projects, so I think it's still in its second version, perhaps in the future, map, a map three might actually have much more about public engagement and involvement and in recognition that what's important to people is very often what's in their own local environment. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Bill. Rob, I think there was somebody in the in the audience who was trying to raise their hand. I don't, I don't know if you could find who they were and see if they wanted to. Um, whilst I do that, I'm, I inadvertently um, didn't type an answer to Is Isabel's latest question, so I'll read it out. So Isabel's asked, would much of the ways to get involved in advocating for archaeology, e.g. contacting MPs and such work, both in Wales and Scotland? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, it's no different um and you know we'd strongly advise it what you need to know is who who are the networks there that might actually help help you with that content and, and understanding so i would definitely encourage you to do that and excellent so we have carlos who's been let in who's i've seen his hand flicker up and down a couple of times carlos so sorry for not bringing you in sooner would you like to have the final question hello carlos are you there You can speak because we've we've made you live. No, I don't think it's going to work. Okay, I'm going to say we're going to we're going to we'll end it there. Um, I just want to thank everyone on the panel and to Rob and Jan for their presentations and for everyone's questions. This is definitely a session we should be running regularly because the conversation in a sense never ends. And I think the more we can all collectively talk about what we love about archeology span and actually find a really effective way to get it across the better. So um, thank you all for attending. And without further ado, I will draw the session to a close. Thank you all.